Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is episode 5, Changing Times. Now at the end of the last show I made rather grandiose promises about talking about Brian Baru. But the 10th century in Irish history is way too packed with interesting events such as wars, coups, invasions and intrigue to get through in just one show. So today we're going to pick up where we left off last time. That's around the year 902 when the Vikings lost control of Dublin and we'll cover about 20 or 30 years. So, all going well and we survive a major battle, the annihilation of an old power and the rise of a new one, we might just get to Brian Baru's grandfather, Knethig, by the end of the show. Don't forget to check out the website irishhistorypodcast.ie There's loads of information and maps to accompany today's show. In episode 4, we saw how the Vikings had developed alliances with Gaelic kings, only to collapse into internal infighting in the 890s. By the end of the show, in the year 902, the world of the Vikings in Ireland came crashing down when an alliance of Gaelic kings led a successful assault on the Viking settlement of Dublin. This seems to have been followed by an exodus of sorts of Vikings from Ireland. And by the end of the year 902, the first phase of Scandinavian interaction with Gaelic Ireland drew to a close. As the Vikings left, Ireland was relatively unchanged by the experience. After a century of slavery, aggression and violence, Ireland surprisingly emerged in a similar way to the way it had been in 795 when the Vikings first arrived. However, unknownst to the people of the time, massive change was just around the corner. Now if you lived in Ireland in 902, change like what was about to happen would have seemed impossible. Ireland was dominated and had been dominated for centuries by the same two powerful kingdoms. If you want to see where these kingdoms were on the map of Ireland, just check out irishhistorypodcast.ie. There's loads of details there to accompany the podcast. Anyway, as I was saying, there were two major powers that had dominated Ireland for centuries. In the north, the O'Neills controlled a belt of land stretching from modern-day Derry in the north as far south as Dublin, while in the south of the island, the O'Gonop ruled lands from Cork to North Tipperary and from the mouth of the Shannon to Waterford. This world dominated by these powers in a way seemed frozen in time, no one alive in 902 could have ever remembered when things were in any way substantially different. And now, particularly when the most likely agent of change, the Vikings, were gone, it probably seemed that this world was destined to last forever. It was so different to our world in its static nature. Even down to small details, this world rarely changed. Clothes, technology, almost everything seemed stuck in time. However, Within six years of 902, this world would be cleaved open. The two major powers would go to war and only one would survive. From this, great change would flow. New powers would arise in Gaelic Ireland and the Vikings would return, influencing great change in Gaelic culture and the economy. In 902, an old world was unknowingly entering its final days. Now while the year 902 was significant because the Vikings left Dublin and indeed Ireland in general, there was an equally important event taking place. While the O'Neill High King, Flan Sinna, was orchestrating the removal of the Vikings from Dublin and reinforcing his position as Ireland's most powerful man, far in the south, the O'Neill's traditional enemy, the O'Gonacht, were reorganising under a warrior bishop. Now strange as it may sound to us, in 902, a relatively ineffectual king of the Ogonacht was deposed and replaced by the Bishop of Cashel, Cormac MacQuillanon. MacQuillanon's bloodlust was in no way tempered by his religious background. As king, Cormac was expansionist, aggressive and violent, all traits found in his main rival, Flansinna of the O'Neills. In the aftermath of Cormac's coup, it didn't take a genius to figure out that with two aggressive men, Flan and Cormac 
at the head of the two most powerful kingdoms on a small island, that war was on the way. However, this war would be unique. Ireland had just witnessed a century of warfare with little change, but the result of the war about to break out would shock everyone. The inevitable war broke out in 906, when the O'Neills under Flan raided Munster. Flan, at this point, was probably just trying to express his position as Ireland's most powerful man. It was kind of the deal in Gaelic Ireland. If someone threatened you, you just raided their territory and showed them who was boss. However, Cormac MacQuillanon wasn't going to be pushed around, and the following year, 907, he had to respond. So he rampaged through the lands of the O'Neills. In this campaign of 907, Cormac MacQuillanon also brought the Kingdom of Connacht under his control, which meant he now controlled Flann's western frontier. This was really laying down the gauntlet to Flann. Cormac wasn't just trying to reinforce the independence of his kingdom. No, he was definitely challenging Flann for his position as Ireland's most powerful king. Now, while these raids undoubtedly undermined Flann's authority, they had a huge impact on ordinary people living on the island. As a Gaelic army passed through hostile territory, they would have killed and looted, leaving the survivors with almost nothing, carrying away as much food as possible and destroying whatever remained. In medieval Ireland, this would have been disastrous, even life-threatening. You see, in a medieval economy, nearly all food would have been grown locally. So when raiding parties destroyed crops or carried away cattle, there was no source of international aid. No, for many, if their food was taken, starvation became a distinct possibility. Even when a Gaelic army passed through what we would call friendly territory, they would have caused huge stress on communities. Although there was only a few hundred or maybe a thousand or so warriors in most armies, they were billeted on communities along the route, and these communities also had to provide for them. In a medieval economy, having to feed a few hundred people for a few days could really stretch resources. The arrival of an army must have been greeted with a smile through gritted teeth. Now, as the people struggled to deal with the effects of the raids and war of 907, everyone knew 908 wasn't going to be peaceful. But no one could have foreseen the decisive nature of the conflict that year. Now, it was pretty obvious what would happen in 908. In 907, as we've just seen, Cormac had forced submission from the kingdom along Flann's western frontier, that's Connacht. By 908, then, the only remaining territories between Cormac and the O'Neill territories in the north were two kingdoms, the Kingdom of Austria and the Kingdom of Leinster. These kingdoms were loyal to Flann. In fact, it seems that Flann was related to the royal families of both kingdoms through marriage. However, if Cormac could force submission from these lands, Flan would have been boxed in. It was all too obvious where the conflict in 908 would be. For Flan, the summer of 908 must have been an anxious time. He knew were he to lose to Cormac again in 908, his authority would be seriously undermined. As the summer moved into autumn, it must have been an incredibly anxious and tense time, as Cormac did nothing. Finally, after the harvest in September 908, Cormac acted. He led an army into Leinster to force submission from Leinster and Ossery. By September 908, the O'Gonacht army had set up a camp, close to a camp of the joint army of the kings of Ossery and Leinster. An account of what happened next survives in the fragmentary annals written about a century after the battle. Now, although it's obviously impossible to know how accurate this account is, it does offer an explanation of how the battle ended in such an unforeseen way. Although Cormac should have been optimistic before the battle, he had been victorious over the O'Neills in 907, it seems that the O'Gonacht army was in disarray. Morale was completely shot. According to the annals, a holy man had fallen from his horse in preparation for battle and this was interpreted as a bad omen by the army. Now, although this event, someone falling from a horse, seems relatively innocuous to us, we shouldn't underestimate the impact that perceived omens could have on medieval people. The medieval world was very superstitious 
and omens such as this were not just the character of the battlefield, they were part and parcel of daily life in a similar way that religion is today. On top of this, you can just imagine how rumours of what had happened would have been exaggerated in a camp of tense warriors waiting for battle. It seems anyway the story spread and the perception grew that the supernatural world was against the army of the Ogonacht and this sapped the morale of the army. In the opposing camp, unbeknownst to the Ogonacht, things were going exceedingly well. There was not just the two armies of Leinster and Ossery there, but secretly, and unbeknownst to the Ogonacht, Flansinna and the army of the O'Neills had arrived. When word of this news reached the Ogonacht camp, it spread terror, but Cormac was compelled to fight by his advisers in order to save face, when the smart option at this point would have been to withdraw. Doubt and fear started to grip the army. Indeed, they only had to look around the camp and realise that many of them would die. According to the fragmentary annals, these doubts converted into actions and desertion became a major problem. In hindsight, this desertion was the smart option. By the end of the day, there would be no one left to chastise or punish this desertion. Despite the poor state of the army, the Ogonacht had one advantage. They were able to choose the site of battle and position themselves with their back to a forest. Normally, the choosing of a site had an enormous advantage in medieval warfare. But when the battle was joined at a place called Balakmunya, or Ballymoon, in modern-day County Carlo, nothing could save the Ogonacht. The fragmentary annals tell us that they were weak and in disorder. Before the battle was even joined, the army started to melt away on the battlefield. Whether the account is accurate in its fine detail, it's obviously impossible to know. It was written a century after the battle. If you just check out the website irishhistorypodcast.ie, there's a translation of it there and you can make up your own mind. One thing, verified beyond doubt, is the outcome. The Ogonacht were completely decimated. Their defeat was so emphatic that this ancient kingdom's very existence started to ebb away on the battlefield in 908. This was a unique event. Normally Gaelic warfare decided who was top dog, but rarely was it ever this decisive. Within four decades, the Ogonacht, who had been a feature in Gaelic Ireland for centuries, ceased to exist in any recognisable form. At Balakmunya in 908, the entire leadership was wiped out. At least seven minor kings were killed on the battlefield. Their ecclesiastical leadership was also routed, as many had taken the field. Don't forget Cormac was also a bishop. To round off the catastrophe, even the high king and bishop himself Cormac McQuillanon was killed. The story goes that there was so much blood on the battlefield as he tried to escape, his horse slipped and fell. Cormac was captured and subsequently beheaded. The aftermath of the battle must have been very different than we imagine. I certainly used to have this picture of jubilation, but when you think about it logically, it can't have been a complete celebration. The victors would have been left in a hellish environment, men cleaved and butchered and suffering on the battlefield. Their celebrations would have been tempered by the fear of infection amongst their wounded comrades. In the medieval world, infection was one of the largest killers. In Flan's camp, there was little to be done for the people with infected wounds, save await an agonising death. Now for Flan Sinna, he probably cared less about these problems. He had ruled for 29 years, he had fought innumerable campaigns and watched men subordinate to him die hand over fist and in his moment of glory he wasn't going to be getting all sentimental. All in all for Flan, this was as good as it got. He had delivered a knockout punch to the Ogonacht but in the process, completely unbeknownst to himself, he had just opened a Pandora's box, one he could not close. In the aftermath of his great victory, Flan made an enormous error. So in the aftermath of his great victory, Flan Sinna was the most powerful man in Ireland, perhaps even the most powerful man Irish history had ever seen. Now his predecessors had all called themselves High Kings of Ireland when they were really just High Kings of the O'Neills. But now Flan Sinna stood within grasp of making himself the first truly High King of all Ireland. He had just annihilated the main power that would have stood in his way. 
However, if Cormac MacRunnon committing to battle at Balak in 908 was the worst move in medieval Irish history, Flansina was about to follow it up with a contender for the second dumbest move. In the following years, instead of forging the first high kingship of Ireland, Flan decided he would try and change the succession rights in his own kingdom. You see, according to custom, Flan's son would not succeed him. His direct successor as High King would be the king of another branch of the O'Neill family, the Northern O'Neills or Kinnail Owen, and then eventually the title would be rotated back to Flan's family. However, the crafty Flan seems to have decided that his family, the Clan Coleman, also known as the Southern O'Neills, would no longer share power with their Northern cousins. This policy was an absolute disaster. Now, while Flan was the most powerful man in 908, in 911, one of the most able men took over the kingship of the Northern O'Neills. This man, Niall Glundov, or Niall of the Black Knee, was Flan's legitimate successor. You can just imagine this guy's reaction when he hears that Flan is going to try and do him out of his high kingship. It just wasn't going to happen. Niall Glundov was never a man to mince his words. He acted decisively. In reply to Flan's plans, he came up with the ultimate, well, see how you like this then, and he tracked down Flan's heir designate, Angus, and killed him. It seemed at this point that Niall's power grew and grew, and he slowly became the de facto High King. Flan, now aged 67, was clearly beyond his best days, and although Niall Glundov was willing to allow him to live out his days as High King, Flan was quite dependent on Niall towards the end of his life. Flan's move in general had been an absolute disaster. Not only had he gone for broke and lost, he had tied down the O'Neills in a dynastic struggle at the very moment they needed to be replacing the O'Gonacht. In the years after Balak Munya, the O'Gonacht had not recovered, and since the O'Neills had not intervened, an old power seeking a new home had. In 914, the Vikings had returned. In the year 914, the O'Gonacht were ravaged by the Vikings. But before we go into any detail, we'll just take a quick look at what happened to the Vikings after they left Ireland. So after their expulsion from Dublin in 902, the Vikings had just fled across the Irish Sea. Things were getting difficult at this point for Vikings everywhere. They could not raid with the impunity they once had. In 910, hope of attacking the continent were dramatically curtailed when the King of the Franks granted a Viking warband under a King Rollo the entire province of Normandy, turning them from poachers to gamekeepers. This event would have a profound impact on Irish history. These Vikings in northern France will go on to become known as Northmen or Normans, but that's for another show. In Britain, things didn't really go well either. Now, back in the 870s, the Vikings had carved out a large kingdom called the Danelaw in northern England. However, this kingdom almost immediately went into decline. The Anglo-Saxons were unified under a series of charismatic leaders, Alfred the Great, and then a brother and sister, Edward the Elder, and Athelfeld of Mercia. Slowly the tide was reversed against the Vikings, and the Danelaw shrank with every year that passed. So in 914, when word of the decline of the O'Gonacht filtered across the Irish Sea, the Vikings saw this as a great opportunity, and they took full advantage and focused huge energy on this dying kingdom. In a repeat of what had happened a hundred years beforehand, they laid waste to the river valleys of the Nore, the Shore and Barrow rivers. In Munster this must have been greeted with dread. An entire generation at this point had grown up where the Vikings were only scary stories told by parents to frighten children. Now this nightmare was becoming real life. The only difference between the attacks of a century beforehand was the sheer weight in numbers. We really get the impression that thousands were arriving. The O'Gonacht were in no position to repel this attack. Indeed, the only fighting force on the island capable of doing so were the O'Neills. But as we've just seen, They were too busy sorting out who would succeed Flan. It would take another two years before Flan died in 916 and Niall Glundov officially became his heir. 
it seems to have been obvious to Niall that the Vikings were going to be a problem. Indeed, he was old enough to remember the Vikings first time round, and presumably he knew that once they established themselves in the south, they would eventually end up in conflict with the O'Neills. Within a few years of their first attacks, the Vikings had constructed several forts around the south coast, most notably at Waterford. Niall Glundov realised he had to act, and so he made the long trek south with an army in 917. That year he laid siege to the Viking settlement at Waterford. However, as he laid siege, another Viking force started to move south through Leinster and approached his rear. When this army routed Niall's ally, the King of Leinster, at St Mullins, Niall had to call off his siege as his rear was being threatened by this second army. This second army was headed up by a fearsome character, a one-eyed Viking king, Citric. Citric was the grandson of the legendary Viking king of Dublin, Ivar, and after his victory at St Mullins, he retook Dublin in 917. After a break of 15 years, the Vikings were firmly back. Indeed, this time, the Viking presence was more substantial than it had been at any time in the previous century. When Niall Glundov took stock of the situation he faced in 917, he must have wondered how it had come to this. When he had started to take power from Flansina, everything seemed to be perfect. However, within three years, the situation was escaping him. He now faced a highly unpredictable but very powerful enemy. It was clear what had to be done. The Vikings just simply had to go, and the first up was Citric. His settlement at Dublin was way too close for comfort. Dublin, built on the Liffey, bordered the lands of the southern O'Neill, and this could not be tolerated. So in autumn 919, Niall led another large army south, this time to Dublin. If he could just defeat Citric, it would be a good start, and certainly he would push the problem further away from his home. If he were to lose, it would be disastrous. For the one-eyed Citric, this was an equally important battle, in many ways a struggle for survival. If he was to have any hope of progressing in the Viking world, he needed a power base. If he was defeated, he would have nowhere left to go. At Kilmashog in Rathfarnham, a few miles south of Dublin, the two armies met. This battle turned out to be disastrous for the O'Neills. Niall Glundov himself was killed, and as he lay dying, he can only have wondered why him. His predecessor was one of the most powerful men in Irish history, and Niall himself was considered a very capable ruler. Yet, he was the first O'Neill High King to die in battle in over a century. This battle was truly devastating, and not just for those who had died on the battlefield. Because, as the survivors carried the news back north, the population must have been terror-stricken. It was only a matter of time before the Vikings followed this defeated army. On the other hand, for Citric, it was a defining moment. Not only had he secured Dublin, but he had also defeated the most serious threat in the O'Neills. From here, he only grew stronger and stronger. In the aftermath of the catastrophic loss at Dublin, the O'Neills set about choosing a third High King in five years. This time it was the turn of Donna Don, son of Flansinna. Fears that the Vikings would attack the O'Neills were realised in 921, although it seems that Donna Don had reorganised because the Vikings who carried out this attack were tracked down and mercilessly slaughtered. While the O'Neills could defend themselves, it wasn't a sign of great strength, and for a brief moment the spectre of a Viking kingdom in Ireland opened up. If a coordinated effort on behalf of the Vikings had been made, they surely would have carved out a kingdom amongst the remains of the Ogonacht kingdom. However, this was not to be. Just as Citric seemed on the verge of carving out a kingdom in Ireland, he left Dublin to become the King of York. Citric really only used his activity in Ireland as a springboard to become king of York, which was a far more powerful settlement. Indeed, this started a policy repeated by several Viking leaders where they used their activity in Ireland as a springboard to propel themselves into power in England. When Citric left in 921, his brother Godfrey became the king of Dublin. Godfrey again did not attempt to create a major kingdom, and aside from some raiding, the serious Viking struggle in Ireland 
was around attempts to unify the various Vikings under Dublin's hegemony. Although they didn't carve out any major kingdom, it was clear the Vikings were here to stay. Now we'll come back to this in the next episode, because this second Viking coming heralded huge changes in Ireland. But today, we're firmly focusing on Gaelic Ireland and its struggle to deal with the collapse of one of its oldest powers. In many ways, the fallout from Balakmunya had been huge. The O'Gonnacht were crippled, a kingdom on the way out, while the O'Neills had seen a man who seemed destined for greatness, Niall Glundov, killed before he could make his mark. And on top of this, the Vikings had returned. However, in a forgotten corner of Munster, there was a new and rising star in Gaelic Ireland. Starting life as a minor noble, this man had little prospects. However, he, his son and his grandson all shared one characteristic. They were ruthlessly driven by ambition. Ambition that could be matched neither by Viking nor Gaelic Irish. This ambition would see this man, Kenethig, challenge for the kingship of Munster. And although he failed, his son, Mathgamon, succeeded. And eventually, Mathgamon's son, Brian, would force submission from the O'Neills. This man, Brian, was known to history as Brian Baru. Tune in next time when we'll check in on Dublin, where the Vikings are building a city to last, while in the southwest, west and his son Machgamon are forging a new power in Gaelic Ireland. Don't forget to send in any feedback you have to history at irishhistorypodcast.ie and check out the fan page on Facebook. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>